Okay, good morning. Okay, so um, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, 20th <laughs> International Mars Society Convention. Uh, and there's a lot to talk about. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, since the first convention, uh, we've made gains. The Mars program has made extraordinary gains in the robotic area. Uh, you know, uh, we've landed, I, I don't know, since then, perhaps eight or so uh, successful missions to Mars, uh, including uh, uh, three rovers, and Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, uh, the, 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 the about four orbiters, uh, five counting the uh, European one and so forth, and India uh, has gotten into the game as well. Um, we've learned a lot more about Mars. Certainly the thesis that Mars was once a warm and wet planet has been abundantly confirmed. Um, that Mars has the resources necessary for life and human civilization uh, has been confirmed. Uh, we've grown as an organization. We've got two operating Mars analog research stations, and we're being emulated by others. Other people are building them. One's been built in Hawaii. Uh, there's uh, Chinese are building one. Okay, uh, we've opened up a new field of research. But the one thing, of course, that we haven't done is gotten an actual Humans to Mars program going. Or to correct that, we actually did get one going, but then it was aborted um, in uh, the Bush. Uh, vision for space exploration. Uh, and actually, um, that's a real problem. Um, the real problem that we face, uh, well, frankly, the U.S. space program has faced since the end of Apollo, is that it hasn't had a clear objective. With the exception of the years 2005 through 2009, that is the Griffin years, uh, NASA has not had an objective for its human spaceflight program. They have been proceeding, I mean, I, I think there were problems with Griffin's plan, but at least it was a plan. Uh, before then and since then, NASA didn't have a plan. So if Griffin's plan was wrong, NASA currently is not even wrong, um, to quote Richard Feynman. Um, so. In a way, this is the problem. Um, this is uh, an image from NASA on uh, a vision of how humans might go to Mars someday. And uh, this is a gigantic uh, nuclear electric spacecraft. Uh, you can see uh, it, it is based on the design of the Imperial Star Destroyer. <laughs> um, so it, it has heritage. Um, it, it's, it's quite large. Mars is, is there for scale. Um, okay. Uh, now, and the great thing about this space destroyer is that uh, it includes within its design every new technology that anyone is interested in getting money to develop. Okay. So if you have this as your vision, you have an excuse to spend money on anything, okay? And that, of course, is its purpose. Um, the, now, clearly, if, you know, I say humans to Mars in a decade. Is this happening in a decade? No, okay? It's not. Uh, is it happening in 20 years? No, it's not. Okay, because this, by the way, involves not just this, but an array of orbital infrastructure, orbiting spaceports, fuel depots, you know, construction shacks, hangars, everything, a whole parallel universe has to be created to service this, okay? Uh, and the fundamental issue is, is this. Uh, do we have a space agency that spends money in order to actually do things, or it does things in order to spend money? Okay. Because NASA is two things at once. One, it's the, it's the banner of the pioneer spirit. It's the cutting edge, the vanguard of human expansion into space. It's all of that. And on the other hand, it is also 
a government agency that distributes funds to various districts and contractors. Okay? It's both of those things at the same time. And uh, uh, the second function is well understood by the political class. Um, and so it succeeds at doing that. Um, but the question of, of what, whether what it proposes has any relevance to what people like us want it to do, it's coincidental and uh, remarkable. So, for instance, two years ago, you had NASA claiming, and as late as one year ago, I, in fact, uh, claiming that the key next step in sending humans to Mars, what we absolutely must do in order to send humans to Mars, is to put a 500-ton rock in orbit around the moon. Okay. Now, if you ask them, how come this didn't appear in your 90-day report? How come this wasn't in von Braun's plan? How come it wasn't in any design reference mission? Where did this come from? They said, well, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, so, and now, of course, the latest thing is to have a space station in orbit around the moon, which also was not in any of those previous plans for sending humans to the moon or Mars. We don't need a space station in orbit around the moon to have a lunar base. We don't need one to have humans to Mars. It serves no function whatsoever. If you want to go to the moon, go to the moon. If you want to go to Mars, go to Mars. Okay, what is this deep space gateway? Okay, um, and we were going to have a debate on this tomorrow night, and I contacted all of the prime advocates of it at NASA's Human Space Flight Program, at Boeing, at Lockheed Martin, at the United Launch Alliance. I contacted the key advocates, every single one. They all declined to show up to debate. So they're asking the taxpayers to spend tens of billions of dollars and a decade of the effort of the next uh, of our space program on a project that is actually completely indefensible because, you know, so we're going to have a discussion tomorrow night instead on what should be the next plan for the U.S. space program. But the, the fundamental issue is this, okay, do you spend money to do things? Do you do things in order to spend money? Do you design the most complex and far-fetched plan you possibly can in order to have a rationale to make everyone's pet program indispensable? Okay, or do you design the simplest plan? Do you run your company to get the job done or do you run your company to please your vendors? It's fundamentally it. Uh, so that's the, the issue that is before us. Now, we have some promising developments going on. Okay, of course, aside from the robotic space program, which has achieved some terrific successes, although it is being hamstrung in part by this kind of thinking, okay, although it has succeeded to a fair degree because part of it is absolutely mission driven. Uh, the, the, uh, but outside of that, of course, the most promising development is SpaceX, and we're going to talk a lot about SpaceX tomorrow night, too. Um, but in short, what you got there is sp somebody spending his money like it's his, um, because some of it is, not all, but some, yes. And, um, and he's doing some real stuff. And he's developing a substantial subset of the hardware that is needed to send humans to Mars. And he's showing that it can be done on, uh, uh, in one-third the time at one-tenth the cost that had been uh, previously deemed acceptable in the mainline aerospace industry. Okay. So he's making the humans to Mars program um, much less of a stretch so that the next time a politician says humans to Mars, can we do it? by the end of my second term, and can we do it for an amount of money that's not going to blow the budget to pieces? The answer is going to come back in a much more positive way than it has in the past. Uh, so that's, that's the, where these two things intersect. But in the meantime, look, you know, do we need this to go to Mars? No. Uh, all right. Okay. Many of you have heard my plan before, but um, many haven't. So. Those who have, forgive me if I just go through it. Uh, we need a heavy lift booster. We do. But that's not science fiction. This is not the future you're looking at here. This is 1970. Okay? This is two generations ago we had this kind of capability. We can have it again. Okay? Uh, if you have it, heavy lift booster, here's your plan. You can launch to Mars every other year, which is an important point I'll come back to late in the talk. But in the first year, you use one of these boosters to throw an unmanned payload to Mars. It flies out to Mars, takes eight months to get to Mars using 
current chemical propulsion. That's the minimum energy trajectory. You can get there a little faster if you put on a little extra gas. Uh, then it uses an aerobrake brake to break into Mars orbit. Uh, and after we check it out, we bring it into land uh, using aero shell to slow us down to subsonic speeds, pop a parachute, use rockets to come down soft like we did with Viking in 1976. Um, Here's the primary object landed. It's an Earth return vehicle. It's a little rocket ship for flying back to Earth. It's got a small cabin for supporting a crew of four uh, coming back from Mars to Earth in the final leg of the mission. No one's in it now. Two methane oxygen chemical propulsion stages, um, which, however, are unfueled. But in the lower stage tanks, some of them that are later going to contain methane, we've got about six tons of liquid hydrogen so that after the landing, uh, we telerobotically drive a small truck containing a 100 kilowatt nuclear reactor a few hundred yards away, turn it on, got some power, we pump in the Martian air, which is carbon dioxide gas. Carbon dioxide can react with hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst. It produces methane, okay, that's natural gas, great fuel, and water, store the fuel, electrolyze the water, it gives us the oxygen. Hydrogen goes to make more methane, and then we run a third reactor in which we take CO2 and we split it into carbon monoxide and oxygen. The oxygen we keep as useful oxidizer. The carbon monoxide we vent as waste. You can do that on Mars. There's no EPA there. That's one of the great reasons for going to Mars. Uh, okay. Actually, if in a later stage in this process, we'll use that carbon monoxide to reduce Martian iron oxide, the red stuff that makes Mars red, produce steel. Because that's how you make steel. You use carbon monoxide reacting with iron oxide. Uh, and steel is useful. But there you go. And you run this system, and at the end of, of, of it, uh, you've turned your six tons of hydrogen from Earth into 108 tons of methane oxygen bipropellant on the surface of Mars. Now, once again, later in the game, we now know there is water on Mars. We know that even at the equator, it's 5% of the soil by weight. Uh, and in other places, it can be 60% of the soil by weight. And there's even places where there's pure ice. We'll be able to extract water, and then we won't even need to bring the hydrogen. But while we do need to bring the hydrogen on the first couple of missions, it's still a leverage of 18 to 1. Okay. And um, there you go. So we've made the propellant on Mars. Next launch window, we launch two more boosters off the Cape. One shoots out another Earth return vehicle. The other shoots a habitat with a crew of four astronauts in it. Uh, they fly to Mars on a slightly faster trajectory, six-month trajectory. Six months is the right amount of time to go to Mars. You do not want to go faster. The reason is this. The six-month trajectory to Mars, OK, or to be a little more technical for uh, some uh, people here in this audience will understand these words. The rest of you won't, but just deal with it. Uh, a C3 of 28 leaving Earth, okay, puts you on a two-year free return trajectory. It will typically take about six months to get to Mars. If you decide not to stop at Mars, it'll take you out to about uh, two, uh, twice the Earth's distance from the sun, and you'll loop back, and you will reach the Earth's distance from the sun, one AU, exactly two years after you left. If you try to, and therefore the Earth will be there to meet you when you get there. It, it, it is if you tried to get to Mars faster, you would, it, and you tried to do a free return, you would loop out further into the outer solar system, and you'd arrive back at 1AU more than two years after you left. Maybe 2.2 years, 2.8 years, whatever. Uh, unless you did it in such a way that you came back in exactly three years, uh, you would miss the Earth again. So. Uh, that's why the two-year trajectory, which is the one that uh, on average gets you to Mars in six months, is the right way to go. If you had a superior propulsion system like nuclear thermal rockets, you would not use it to go to Mars faster. You would use it to increase your payload and therefore the safety of the mission by making your life support system quadru quadruply redundant instead of doubly redundant or something of this sort. Uh, and that, frankly, that does you much more good in any case than cutting one month off the flight time. Uh, so you go to Mars, six months, you get there, you fire a pyrotechnic, the cable is, well, we're not up to that part yet. Um, okay, here's the habitat. Um, we got our return ride waiting for us to Mars, so we don't need an Imperial destroyer to get us there. We don't even need a Millennium Falcon. Tuna can will do. Uh, here's typical layout of the hab, little stateroom for each of four astronauts, science. Uh, uh, exercise area, uh, galley, and so forth. 
The center is your solar flare storm shelter. You pack that with provisions. That gives you the shielding to mask out solar flares. It does not give you the shielding to mask out cosmic rays, but that danger is overdrawn. Uh, and in fact, there's a scientist right here at this university who's been publishing papers saying cosmic rays will destroy your brains on, on your way to Mars. This guy, he's been giving mice a dose of about twice the amount that they would get to, uh, if they were astronauts going to Mars, but that's not the main difference. The main difference is he does it at a rate 40,000 times as fast as they would get it. And that's real important. In toxicology, the rate at which you get a dose is critical. Okay, you could drink a glass of wine a night for your whole life, and it wouldn't hurt you. In fact, if it was red wine, it would improve your health. Um, but if you drank a thousand glasses of wine in one night, you would be dead. Okay, in this case, it's 40,000. Uh, so this is nonsense. And, and the proof, by the way, aside from all sorts of knowledge we actually have of radiation, is here's 10 astronauts and cosmonauts, and since this chart was made, there's been more, uh, who have been in space on either the space station or the Mir uh, long enough to get cosmic ray doses comparable to what they would get going to Mars and back, and there's been no radiological casualties among this group at all. Okay. Uh, so, but what we have seen is health deterioration due to zero G. That can be counteracted by tethering off the upper stage of the booster that threw us to Mars, spinning up. This will create artificial gravity, and we can avoid the weakening of bones and muscles that zero gravity causes. Uh, now, I should mention six-month transit to Mars is the same as a standard rotation on the space station, and of course people like Peggy Whitson have done twice that, uh, and they certainly survive it. But they are weakened, and since the task of on Mars is exploration, field exploration is like heavy-duty backpacking, okay, you don't want to have them weakened. You want them to be effective. That's why I've gone to Mars. So uh, I believe artificial gravity is the right way to go, and I think it's long overdue that NASA launched an artificial gravity satellite uh, so as to see the long-term effects of artificial gravity, uh, or partial gravity, rather, on uh, mammals from Earth. Uh, it's, in fact, a scandal that they haven't done it since they've been in space since 1958. Uh, so they get close to Mars, they fire a pyro, upper stage goes away, they go and land at site number one. We have a Earth return vehicle following on them out to Mars. If anything goes wrong, we can bring that down to land near them. Otherwise, it lands at a new site where it starts making propellant to support the next mission, which flies there two years later, but otherwise uh, is, um, and then along with another Earth return vehicle, which is their backup, but which otherwise opens up site number three. So the idea here is that every two years, we launch two boosters to Mars one to open up a new site, one to exploit the previously open site. That's an average rate, launch rate of one per year. Two boosters every two years, average one per year. If we had a heavy lift system, okay, well, when we were flying shuttles, we were flying them at a rate of six a year when we were serious. Okay, this is one-sixth of our heavy lift capability. That means we can do this program in parallel with other programs, such as, for instance, a moon program. And so there are people who say, oh, the moon, not Mars. And some people say Mars, not the moon. That is not my position. If it's the moon or Mars, yes, I'll take Mars. But I don't think that it is. I think that if we had a Mars program, we would want to run a moon program in parallel, not because we have to be on the moon for 40 years before we go to Mars, no. Okay, and not because, gee, we can't go to Mars, or because Mars will cost a trillion dollars, like Paul Spudis says, which is nonsensical. Um, no, we're going to go a bit longer than that. Uh, the, um, uh, but because uh, while Mars is the main objective, if we have a capability that can get us to Mars, it also allows us to go to the moon. Uh, and so we should take it all. Uh, so here, as people know, is an actual photograph of the Mars base. <laughs> um, there's the Earth return vehicle. There's the habitat. Uh, reactor in the background, some solar panels for backup power, uh, a small pressurized rover, looks like a little SUV for long distance exploration, an inflatable greenhouse to learn how to grow crops on Mars. Uh, explore there for a year and a half, because get the planets to move around so you have an open window back. At the end of that time, we go back, we leave this behind, it's available for the use of future missions. Okay, and there you go. And 
so that initially we might, excuse me, have a wide distribution of landing sites to explore lots of areas, although close enough to each other that they're within the one-way driving range of the ground transportation. Uh, okay, there's Texas is on Mars, and if you land there and you want to avoid the flood, you can just drive over to New Mexico. Um, but anyway, he, Mars is much bigger than Texas. Here's the proof. Anyway, uh, but at a certain point when we do decide what is the best place to build a permanent base, we just start landing them all in the same place. And these are second generation HABs that you see here who have landing gear whose legs not only articulate up and down as all landing gear must, but also side to side. This would allow them to walk much as the Martians did in the War of the Worlds. So this, this method has heritage. Um, <laughs> all right, now I want to come back to this, the moon. Okay, how do you build a lunar base? Um, use the same hardware. In fact, this is the key to building a lunar base. Build a lunar base with the same hardware set that is 80% of the hardware set you need to go to Mars. That makes the lunar base much more useful. It makes it much more justifiable, and guess what? It's the best lunar base. See, you have a lander that is big enough to land a HAB module on Mars. It can also land a Earth return vehicle, which only needs one stage to come back from the moon, on the moon. Now, you say, well, gee, you're going to come back direct from the surface of the moon? Absolutely. Because, you see, while the lunar orbit rendezvous plan that we use in Apollo was the optimal plan if you were just doing an expedition, it saves mass. If you have a lunar base that can make lunar oxygen, let alone lunar hydrogen and oxygen, which looks like we can make because there's ice at the poles of the moon, okay, direct return is the most mass efficient way, and by far the most cost efficient way because it saves you an entire vehicle. In other words, if you have a lunar base, you want to use direct, ret direct return, the launch window to Earth is always open. Earth is always in the exact same place in the sky as viewed from the surface of the moon. Okay, you, you, there's no phasing, there's no nothing. This is the, by far the best way to do a lunar base. You don't have anybody playing Mike Collins in lunar orbit uh, you know, for three months while you're exploring the moon. Okay accomplishing nothing, let alone an entire space station filled with people accomplishing nothing in a deep space toll booth. The, the, uh, th this is the right plan for a lunar base. This is the plan that makes use of lunar resources. And you make use of lunar resources, then you can have hopping vehicles that give you global mobility on the moon. So for the lunar base gives you full access to the whole moon. And you can use it to support, for instance, the development of an um, interferometer of telescopes distributed across the surface of the moon, which would be fantastic in terms of what we would learn about the physics of the cosmos from such an instrument and extrasolar planets and all of that. Okay, but here then is the deal. Okay. This is the hardware set you need to do both Moon and Mars. A heavy lift vehicle that can shoot payloads directly to the Moon or Mars. HAB module for the Moon and Mars. Earth return vehicle, one stage to come back from the Moon, two stages to come back from the Mars. And the aeroshell module, which you wouldn't want to use for the Moon unless it was made in Senator Shelby's state. Now, the, uh, okay, but, the, um, but there it is. Now, see, here's the thing. You can start out with the moon, as some people do, want to do. Okay, but you start out developing the, the, the subset of the hardware that you can then add to on, on the other side. And then furthermore, if you take this approach to the moon, it has the added benefit of disciplining the Mars mission so it doesn't go off on saying, let's do Mars with gigantic interplanetary plasma drive spaceships. We have this stuff here, and we just add these other two modules, and we've got Mars. Okay, So this makes the moon mission much more tenable. It's the optimum uh, uh, architecture for doing the moon. And it forces the Mars mission to be a program, not a vision. Okay? And, and that's what we need to do. So uh, the, let's just see where we are here. Okay, I got three minutes. I'm going to take two questions. Let's go. Sir. You know, I have to say the Lord has been talking about it and has pretty been involved with Apollo. The real thing to try to mark is Europe and lunar Mm-hmm.
Well, I, I think you're exactly right. In other words, Apollo applications was a very uh, practical approach to establishing a moon base and a Mars base because it was building on a concrete set of mission-driven uh, hardware. Okay, and once again, we didn't get to the moon because uh, of various constituencies who had supported a random set of programs and the leaders of those programs met by accident in the cafeteria of Marshall Space Flight Center in 1963 and said, you know, with your Saturn V and my command module and his lunar excursion module, if we put these things together, we could go to the moon. I never saw that. No, in, in, instead we had a plan for a moon mission. From the plan came uh, well, first of all, we had a mission, which was go to the moon. From that came a plan. From the plan came designs for workable vehicles. And from those came the selection of what technologies we need to develop. As opposed to, we got all these people working on interesting technologies. How can we create a plan that uses all of them? Uh, and uh, there you go. Next question. So the other destination in the solar system besides Mars seems to be the asteroid. Yes. Right, we want to go there to mine. So how does your plan get us so how does your plan help us get to asteroid mining as opposed to the giant Battlestar Galactica ship? Well, for example, if you look at this, if you had uh, here th that booster and that HAB module with the aeroshell, then you've got an asteroid mission. Uh, the, you could throw the thing on a direct trajectory uh, to an asteroid uh, and use that as your house while you're in the neighborhood, and then you come back to Earth and re-enter and land. Uh, in other words, yes, uh, this hardware set enables both. The Battlestar Galactica is a, is a path to nowhere. It's, uh, you know, it, it, what can I say? Uh, it, it is not a mission, it is a vision. This is a, a set of hardware. It gives us the moon, the Mars. It gives us the near-Earth asteroids as well. Um, so once again, um, this is our mission. Our mission is to have a space program that actually goes somewhere. Okay, we're paying for this thing. It did remarkable things in the 60s because it was mission driven. Okay, it had a mission. It, it had a mission which was not primarily scientific. It was to astound the world with what free people can do. Right now, it's astounding the world with what free people can't do. <laughs> that that um, needs to be changed. And uh, that's our mission. Let's change that. Thank you. Thank you.